Salvador Dali, Salvador Domingo Felipe Jacinto Dali I Domenech, first Marquis of Dali de Pubal, known professionally as Salvador Dali, was a prominent Spanish surrealist born in Figueres, Catalonia, Spain. Dali was a skilled draftsman, best known for the striking and bizarre images in his surrealist work. His painterly skills are often attributed to the influence of Renaissance masters. His best known work, The Persistence of Memory, was completed in August 1931. Dali's expansive artistic repertoire included film, sculpture, and photography, at times in collaboration with a range of artists in a variety of media. Dali attributed his love of everything that is gilded and excessive, my passion for luxury and my love of oriental clothes to an Arab lineage, claiming that his ancestors were descendants of the Moors. Dali was highly imaginative, and also enjoyed indulging in unusual and grandiose behavior. To the dismay of those who held his work in high regard, and to the irritation of his critics, his eccentric manner and attention-grabbing public actions sometimes drew more attention than his artwork. Salvador Dali was born on May 11, 1904, at 8.45 a.m. GMT, on the first floor of Carrer Montreal, 20, in the town of Figueres, in the Importa region, close to the French border in Catalonia, Spain. Dali's older brother, who had also been named Salvador, had died of gastroenteritis nine months earlier, on August 1, 1903. His father, Salvador Rafael Aniceto Dali Cusi was a middle-class lawyer and notary an anti-clerical atheist and Catalan federalist, whose strict disciplinary approach was tempered by his wife, Felipa Domenech Ferries, who encouraged her son's artistic endeavors. In the summer of 1912, the family moved to the top floor of Carrer Montreal 24. When he was five, Dali was taken to his brother's grave and told by his parents that he was his brother's reincarnation, a concept which he came to believe. Out of his brother, Dali said, we, resembled each other like two drops of water but we had different reflections. He was probably a first version of myself but conceived too much in the absolute. Images of his long dead brother would reappear embedded in his later works, including portrait of my dead brother. Dali also had a sister, Anna Maria, who was three years younger. In 1949, she published a book about her brother, Dali as seen by his sister. His childhood friends included future FC Barcelona footballers Sajibarba and Josep Samitier. During holidays at the Catalan resort of Cadiz, the trio played football together. Dali attended drawing school. In 1916, he also discovered modern painting on a summer vacation trip to Cadiz with the family of Ramon Picot, a local artist who made regular trips to Paris. The next year, Dali's father organized an exhibition of his charcoal drawings in their family home. He had his first public exhibition at the Municipal Theater in Figueres in 1918, a site he would return to decades later. On February 6, 1921, Dali's mother died of uterus cancer. Dali was 16 years old, he later said his mother's death was the greatest blow I had experienced in my life. I worshipped her. I could not resign myself to the loss of a being on whom I counted to make invisible the unavoidable blemishes of my soul. After her death, Dali's father married his deceased wife's sister. Dali did not resent this marriage, because he had great love and respect for his aunt. In 1922, Dali moved into the Residencia de Estudiantes in Madrid and studied at the Real Academia de Bellas Artes de San Fernando. Aileen Tall, Dali already drew attention as an eccentric and dandy. He had long hair and sideburns, coat, stockings, and knee breeches in the style of English esthetes of the late 19th century. At the Residencia, he became close friends with Pepin Bello, Luis Buñuel, and Federico Garcia Lorca. The friendship with Lorca had a strong element of mutual passion, but Dali rejected the poet's sexual advances. It was his paintings in which he experimented with Cubism, however, that earned him the most attention from his fellow students. Since there were no Cubist artists in Madrid at the time, his knowledge of Cubist art had come from magazine articles and a catalog given to him by Picot. Dali, still unknown to the public, illustrated a book for the first time in 1924. It was a publication of the Catalan poem Le Bruixes de Lers by his friend and schoolmate, poet Carlos Fagas de Climent. Dali also experimented with Dada, which influenced his work throughout his life. Dali held his first solo exhibition at Galerie d'Almau in Barcelona, from 14 to November 27, 1925. At the time Dali was not yet immersed in the surrealist style for which he would later become famous. 
The exhibition was well received by the public and critics. The following year he exhibited again at Galrit Almel, from December 31, 1926 to January 14, 1927, with the support of the art critic. Dali left the Academy in 1926, shortly before his final exams. His mastery of painting skills at that time was evidenced by his realistic The Basket of Bread, painted in 1926. That same year, he made his first visit to Paris, where he met Pablo Picasso, whom the young Dali revered. Doc Picasso had already heard favorable reports about Dali from Joan Miro, a fellow Catalan who introduced him to many surrealist friends. As he developed his own style over the next few years, Dali made a number of works strongly influenced by Picasso and Miro. Some trends in Dali's work that would continue throughout his life were already evident in the 1920s. Dali was influenced by many styles of art, ranging from the most academically classic, to the most cutting-edge avant-garde. His classical influences included Raphael, Bronzino, Francisco de Zerberon, Vermeer, and Velázquez. He used both classical and modernist techniques, sometimes in separate works and sometimes combined dot exhibitions of his works in Barcelona attracted much attention and a mixture of praise and puzzled debate from critics. Dali grew a flamboyant mustache, influenced by 17th-century Spanish master painter Diego Velázquez. This mustache became an iconic trademark of his appearance for the rest of his life. In 1929, Dali collaborated with surrealist film director Luis Buñuel on the short film. His main contribution was to help Buñuel write the script for the film. Dali later claimed to have also played a significant role in the filming of the project, but this is not substantiated by contemporary accounts. Also, in August 1929, Dali met his lifelong and primary muse and future wife Gala, born Elena Ivanovna Diakonova. She was a Russian immigrant ten years his senior, who at that time was married to surrealist poet Paul Elwar. In the same year, Dali had important professional exhibitions and officially joined the Surrealist group in the Montparnasse quarter of Paris. His work had already been heavily influenced by Surrealism for two years. The Surrealists hailed what Dali called his paranoiac critical method of accessing the subconscious for greater artistic creativity. Meanwhile, Dali's relationship with his father was close to rupture. Don Salvador Dali y Cusi strongly disapproved of his son's romance with Gala and saw his connection to the Surrealists as a bad influence on his morals. The final straw was when Don Salvador read in a Barcelona newspaper that his son had recently exhibited in Paris a drawing of the Sacred Heart of Jesus Christ, with a provocative inscription, Sometimes, I spit for fun on my mother's portrait. Outraged, Don Salvador demanded that his son recant publicly. Dali refused, perhaps out of fear of expulsion from the Surrealist group and was violently thrown out of his paternal home on December 28, 1929. His father told him that he would be disinherited, and that he should never set foot in Cadacas again. The following summer, Dali and Gala rented a small fisherman's cabin in a nearby bay at Port Ligat. He bought the place, and over the years enlarged it by buying the neighboring fisherman cabins, gradually building his much-beloved villa by the sea. Dali's father would eventually relent and come to accept his son's companion. In 1931, Dali painted one of his most famous works, The Persistence of Memory, which introduced a surrealistic image of soft, melting pocket watches. The general interpretation of the work is that the soft watches are a rejection of the assumption that time is rigid or deterministic. This idea is supported by other images in the work, such as the wide expanding landscape, and other limp watches shown being devoured by ants. Dali and Gala, having lived together since 1929, were civilly married on January 30, 1934 in Paris. They later remarried in a church ceremony on 8 August 1958 at saint marty -Val. In addition to inspiring many artworks throughout her life, Gala would act as Dali's business manager, supporting their extravagant lifestyle while adeptly steering clear of insolvency. Gala seemed to tolerate Dali's dalliances with younger muses, secure in her own position as his primary relationship. Dali continued to paint her as they both aged producing sympathetic and adoring images of her. The tense, complex and ambiguous relationship lasting over 50 years would later become the subject of an opera, Cho, Dali by Catalan composer Xavier Bengaro. Dali was introduced to the United States by art dealer Julian Levy in 1934. The exhibition in New York of Dali's works, including Persistence of Memory, created an immediate sensation. Social register listes fitted him at a specially organized Dali ball. He showed up wearing a glass case on his chest, 
which contained a brassiere. In that year, Dolly and Gala also attended a masquerade party in New York, hosted for them by Eris Kares Crosby, the inventor of the brassiere. For their costumes, they dressed as the Lindbergh baby and his kidnapper. The resulting uproar in the press was so great that Dolly apologized. When he returned to Paris, the Surrealists confronted him about his apology for a Surrealist act. While the majority of the Surrealist artists had become increasingly associated with leftist politics, Dali maintained an ambiguous position on the subject of proper relationship between politics and art. Leading Surrealist André Breton accused Dali of defending the new and irrational in the Hitler phenomenon, but Dali quickly rejected this claim, saying, I am Hitlerian neither in fact nor intention. Dali insisted that surrealism could exist in an apolitical context and refused to explicitly denounce fascism. Among other factors, this had landed him in trouble with his colleagues. Later in 1934, Dali was subjected to a trial, in which he narrowly avoided being expelled from the surrealist group. To this, Dali retorted, the difference between the surrealists and me is, I myself am surrealism. In 1936, Dali took part in the London International Surrealist Exhibition. His lecture, titled, was delivered while wearing a deep-sea diving suit and helmet. He had arrived carrying a billiard cue and leading a pair of Russian wolfhounds, and had to have the helmet unscrewed as he gasped for breath. He commented that I just wanted to show that I was plunging deeply into the human mind. In 1936, Dolly, age 32, was featured on the cover of Time magazine. Also in 1936, at the premiere screening of Joseph Cornell's film Rose Hobart at Julian Levy's Gallery in New York City. Dolly became famous for another incident. Levy's program of short surrealist films was timed to take place at the same time as the first surrealism exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art, featuring Dolly's work. Dolly was in the audience at the screening, but halfway through the film, he knocked over the projector in a rage. My idea for a film is exactly that, and I was going to propose it to someone who would pay to have it made, he said. I never wrote it down or told anyone, but it is as if he had stolen it. Other versions of Dolly's accusation tend to the more poetic, he stole it from my subconscious. Or even he stole my dreams. In this period, Dolly's main patron in London was the wealthy Edward James. He had helped Dolly emerge into the art world by purchasing many works and by supporting him financially for two years. They also collaborated on two of the most enduring icons of the Surrealist movement, the lobster telephone and the Mae West Lips sofa. Meanwhile, Spain was going through a civil war with many artists taking a side or going into exile. In 1938, Dali met Sigmund Freud thanks to Stefan Zweig. Dali started to sketch Freud's portrait, while the 82-year-old celebrity confided to others that this boy looks like a fanatic. Dali was delighted upon hearing later about this comment from his hero. Later, in September 1938, Salvador Dali was invited by Gabrielle Coco Chanel to her house La Pause in Roquebrune on the French Riviera. There he painted numerous paintings he later exhibited at Julian Levy Gallery in New York. At the end of the 20th century, La Pause was partially replicated at the Dallas Museum of Art to welcome the Reeves collection and part of Chanel's original furniture for the house. Also in 1938, Dali unveiled Rainy Taxi, a three dimensional artwork consisting of an actual automobile with two mannequin occupants. The piece was first displayed at the Galerie Beaux-Arts in Paris at the Exposition Internationale du Surrealisme, organized by André Breton and Paul Elwar. The exposition was designed by artist Marcel Duchamp, who also served as host. At the 1939 New York World's Fair, Dali debuted his Dream of Venus Surrealist Pavilion, located in the amusements area of the exposition. It featured bizarre sculptures, statues, and live nude models in costumes made of fresh seafood, an event photographed by Horst P. Horst, George Platlines, and Murray Corman. Like most attractions in the amusements area, an admission fee was charged. In 1939, André Breton coined the derogatory nickname Evita Dollars, an anagram for Salvador Dali, a phonetic rendering of the French phrase Evita Dollars, meaning eager for dollars. This was a derisive reference to the increasing commercialization of Dali's work and the perception that Dali sought self-aggrandizement through fame and fortune. The Surrealists, many of whom were closely connected to the French Communist Party at the time, expelled him from their movement. Some Surrealists henceforth spoke of Dali in the past tense, as if he were dead. The Surrealist movement and various members thereof would continue to issue extremely harsh polemics against Dali until the time of his death, and beyond. In 1940, 
As World War II tore through Europe, Dali and Gayla retreated to the United States, where they lived for eight years splitting their time between New York and Monterey, California. They were able to escape because on June 20, 1940, they were issued visas by Aristides de Souza Mendes, Portuguese consul in Bordeaux, France. Salvador and Gaila Dali crossed into Portugal and subsequently sailed on the ex Cambian from Lisbon to New York in August 1940. Dali's arrival in New York was one of the catalysts in the development of that city as a world arts center in the post war years. After the move, Dali returned to the practice of Catholicism. During this period, Dali never stopped writing, wrote Robert and Nicholas Discharns. Dali worked prolifically in a variety of media during this period, designing jewelry, clothes, furniture stage sets for plays and ballet, and retail store display windows. In 1939, while working on a window display for Bonwit Teller, he became so enraged by unauthorized changes to his work that he shoved a decorative bathtub through a plate glass window. Dali spent the winter of 1940-41 at Hampton Manor, the residence of bra designer and patron of the arts Karis Crosby, near Bowling Green in Caroline County, Virginia. During his time there, he spent his time on various projects. He was described as a showman by residents in the local newspaper. In 1941, Dali drafted a film scenario for Jean Gumbine called Moontide. In 1942, he published his autobiography, The Secret Life of Salvador Dali. He wrote catalogues for his exhibitions, such as that at the Nodler Gallery in New York in 1943, in which he attacked some often used surrealist techniques be proclaiming. Surrealism will at least have served to give experimental proof that total sterility and attempts at automatizations have gone too far and have led to a totalitarian system. Today's laziness and the total lack of technique have reached their paroxysm in the psychological signification of the current twos of the college. He also wrote a novel, published in 1944, about a fashion salon for automobiles. This resulted in a drawing by Edwin Cox in the Miami Herald, depicting Dolly dressing an automobile in an evening gown. In The Secret Life, Dali suggested that he had split with Luis Buñuel because the latter was a communist and an atheist. Buñuel was fired from his position at the Museum of Modern Art, supposedly after Cardinal Spellman of New York went to see Iris Berry, head of the film department at MoMA. Buñuel then went back to Hollywood where he worked in the dubbing department of Warner Brothers from 1942 to 1946. In his 1982 autobiography Mondo Ernier Super, Buñuel wrote that, over the years, he had rejected Dali's attempts at reconciliation. An Italian friar, Gabriele Maria Berardi, claimed to have performed an exorcism on Dali while he was in France in 1947. In 2005, a sculpture of Christ on the cross was discovered in the friar's estate. It had been claimed that Dali gave this work to his exorcist out of gratitude, and two Spanish art experts confirmed that there were adequate stylistic reasons to believe the sculpture was made by Dali. In 1948 Dali and Gala moved back into their house in Port Leggett, on the coast near Cadacas. For the next three decades, he would spend most of his time there painting, taking time off and spending winters with his wife in Paris and New York. His acceptance and implicit embrace of Franco's dictatorship were strongly disapproved of by other Spanish artists and intellectuals who remained in exile. In 1959, André Breton organized an exhibit called Homage to Surrealism celebrating the 40th anniversary of Surrealism, which contained works by Dully, Joan Miro, Enrique Tapera, and Eugenio Grinnell. Breton vehemently fought against the inclusion of Dali's Sistine Madonna in the International Surrealism Exhibition in New York the following year. Late in his career Dali did not confine himself to painting, but explored many unusual or novel media and processes, for example, he experimented with bulletist artworks. Many of his late works incorporated optical illusions, negative space, visual puns and tromploy visual effects. He also experimented with pointillism, enlarged halftone dot grids, and stereoscopic images. He was among the first artists to employ holography in an artistic manner. In Dolly's later years, young artists such as Andy Warhol proclaimed him an important influence on pop art. Dolly also developed a keen interest in natural science and mathematics. This is manifested in several of his paintings, notably from the 1950s, in which he painted his subjects as composed of rhinoceros horn shapes. According to Dali, the rhinoceros horn signifies divine geometry because it grows on a logarithmic spiral. He linked the rhinoceros to themes of chastity and to the Virgin Mary. Dali was also fascinated by DNA and the Tesseract, 
an unfolding of a hypercube is featured in the painting Crucifixion. At some point, Dali had a glass floor installed in a room near his studio in Liggett. He made extensive use of it to study foreshortening, both from above and from below, incorporating dramatic perspectives of figures and objects into his paintings. He also delighted in using the room for entertaining guests and visitors to his house and studio. In many of his paintings, Dali used anamorphosis, a form of eccentric and exaggerated perspective which distorts objects beyond recognition, however, when seen from a particular skewed viewpoint, a legible depiction emerges. He used the power of this technique to conceal secret or forbidden images in plain sight. Dali's post-World War II period bore the hallmarks of technical virtuosity and an intensifying interest in optical effects, science, and religion. He became an increasingly devout Catholic, while at the same time he had been inspired by the shock of Hiroshima and the dawning of the Atomic Age. Therefore, Dali labeled this period nuclear mysticism. In paintings such as the Madonna of Portlegat and Corpus Hypercubus, Dali sought to synthesize Christian iconography with images of material disintegration inspired by nuclear physics. His nuclear mysticism works included such notable pieces as La Guerre de Perpignan and the Hallucinogenic Tariador. In 1960, Dali began work on his theater and museum in his hometown of Figueres. It was his largest single project and the main focus of his energy through 1974, when it opened. He continued to make additions through the mid-1980s. Dali continued to indulge in publicity stunts and self-consciously outrageous behavior. To promote his 1962 book The World of Salvador Dali, he appeared in a Manhattan bookstore on a bed, wired up to a machine that traced his brain waves and blood pressure. He would autograph books while thus monitored, and the book buyer would also be given the paper chart recording. In 1968, Dali filmed the humorous television advertisement for chocolates. In this, he proclaims in French Je suis fou du chocolat l'on bon, while biting a morsel, causing him to become cross-eyed and his mustache to swivel upwards. Also in 1968, his status as an extravagant artist was put to use in a publicity campaign for Braniff International Airlines. In 1969, he designed the Chupa Chups logo, in addition to facilitating the design of the advertising campaign for the 1969 Eurovision Song Contest and creating the large on-stage metal sculpture that stood at the Teatro Real in Madrid. In the television program Dirty Dolly, a private view broadcast on Channel 4 on June 3, 2007, art critic Brian Sewell described his acquaintance with Daly in the late 1960s which included lying down in the fetal position without trousers in the armpit of a figure of Christ and masturbating for Dali, who pretended to take photos while fumbling in his own trousers. In 1968, Dali had bought a castle in Pubile for Gala, and starting in 1971 she would retreat there alone for weeks at a time. By Dali's own admission, he had agreed not to go there without written permission from his wife. His fears of abandonment and estrangement from his longtime artistic muse contributed to depression and failing health. In 1980 at age 76, Dali's health took a catastrophic turn. His right hand trembled terribly, with Parkinson-like symptoms. His near senile wife allegedly had been dosing him with a dangerous cocktail of unprescribed medicine that damaged his nervous system, thus causing an untimely end to his artistic capacity. In 1982, King Juan Carlos bestowed on Dali the title of Marx de Dali de Pubal in the nobility of Spain, hereby referring to Pubal, the place where he lived. The title was in first instance hereditary, but on request of Dali changed to life only in 1983. Gala died on June 10, 1982, at the age of 87. After Gala's death, Dali lost much of his will to live. He deliberately dehydrated himself, possibly as a suicide attempt. There are also claims that he had tried to put himself into a state of suspended animation as he had read that some microorganisms could do. He moved from Figueres to the castle in Pubal which was the site of her death and her grave. In May 1983, Dali revealed what would be his last painting, The Swallow's Tale, a work heavily influenced by the mathematical catastrophe theory of René Tom. In 1984, a fire broke out in his bedroom under unclear circumstances. It was possibly a suicide attempt by Dali, or possibly simple negligence by his staff. Dali was rescued by friend and collaborator Robert Descharnes and returned to Figueres, where a group of his friends, patrons, and fellow artists saw to it that was comfortable living in his theater museum in his final years. 
There have been allegations that Dali was forced by his guardians to sign blank canvases that would later, even after his death, be used in forgeries and sold as originals. It is also alleged that he knowingly sold otherwise blank lithograph paper which he had signed, possibly producing over 50,000 such sheets from 1965 until his death. As a result, art dealers tend to be wary of late graphic works attributed to Dali. In November 1988, Dali entered the hospital with heart failure. A pacemaker had been implanted previously. On December 5, 1988, he was visited by King Juan Carlos, who confessed that he had always been a serious devotee of Dali. Dali gave the king a drawing, Head of Europa, which would turn out to be Dali's final drawing. In early January 1989, Dali was returned to the Teatro Museo and on his return he made his last public appearance. He was taken in a wheelchair to a room where press and TV were waiting and made a brief statement saying on the morning of January 23, 1989, while his favorite record of Tristan and Isolde played, Dali died of heart failure at the age of 84. He is buried in the crypt below the stage of his theater and museum in Figueres. The location is across the street from the church of St. Pierre, where he had his baptism, first communion, and funeral, and is only from the house where he was born. The Gala Salvador Dali Foundation currently serves as his official estate. The U.S. copyright representative for the Gala Salvador Dali Foundation is the Artists' Rights Society. On June 26, 2017 it was announced that a judge in Madrid had ordered the exhumation of Dali's body in order to obtain samples for a paternity suit. Maria Pilar Abel Martinez, who works as a psychic and tarot card reader from Figueres, Girona, born in 1956, had stated that her mother, a maid, had been having an affair with a painter in 1955. Ms. Abel claimed that her mother had told her that Dali was her father. At the time of the alleged affair, Dali was married to Gala. The exhumation took place on the evening of 20th of July, and DNA was extracted. On Wednesday, September 6, 2017, the Dali Foundation stated that the tests carried out proved conclusively that Dali and Martinez were not related. Joan Manuel Sevillano, manager of the Foundation Gala Salvador Dali, denounced the exhumation as inappropriate. Dali employed extensive symbolism in his work. For instance, the hallmark melting watches that first appear in the persistence of memory suggest Einstein's theory that time is relative and not fixed. The idea for clocks functioning symbolically in this way came to Dali when he was staring at a runny piece of camembert cheese on a hot August day. The elephant is also a recurring image in Dali's works. It appeared in his 1944 work Dream Caused by the Flight of a Bee Around a Pomegranate a Second Before Awakening. The Elephants, inspired by John Lorenzo Bernini's sculpture base in Rome of an elephant carrying an ancient obelisk, are portrayed with long, multi-jointed, almost invisible legs of desire along with obelisks on their backs. Coupled with the image of their brittle legs, these encumbrances, noted for their phallic overtones, create a sense of phantom reality. The elephant is a distortion in space, one analysis explains, its spindly legs contrasting the idea of weightlessness with structure. I am painting pictures which make me die for joy, I am creating with an absolute naturalness, without the slightest aesthetic concern, I am making things that inspire me with a profound emotion and I am trying to paint them honestly. Salvador Dali, in Don Aids, Dali in Surrealism. The egg is another common Dali-esque image. He connects the egg to the prenatal and intrauterine, thus using it to symbolize hope and love, it appears in The Great Masturbator and The Metamorphosis of Narcissus. The metamorphosis of Narcissus also symbolized death and petrification. There are also giant sculptures of X in various locations at Dali's house in Port Ligat as well as at the Dali Theater and Museum in Figueres. Various other animals appear throughout his work as well, ants point to death, decay, and immense sexual desire, the snail is connected to the human head, and locusts are a symbol of waste and fear. Both Dali and his father enjoyed eating sea urchins, freshly caught in the sea near Cotacas. The radial symmetry of the sea urchin fascinated Dali, and he adapted its form to many artworks. Other foods also appear throughout his work. References to Dali in the context of science are made in terms of his fascination with the paradigm shift that accompanied the birth of quantum mechanics in the 20th century. Inspired by Werner Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, in 1958 he wrote in his Antimatter Manifesto, in the Surrealist period, I wanted to create the iconography of the interior world and the world of the marvelous, of my father Freud. Today, the exterior world and that of physics has transcended the one of psychology. My father today is Dr. Heisenberg. In this respect, 
the disintegration of the persistence of memory, which appeared in 1954, in harking back to the persistence of memory and in portraying Pat painting in fragmentation and disintegration, summarizes Dali's acknowledgement of the new science. Dali was a versatile artist. Some of his more popular works are sculptures and other objects, and he is also noted for his contributions to theater, fashion, and photography, among other areas. Two of the most popular objects of the Surrealist movement were Lobster Telephone and Mae West Lips Sofa, completed by Dali in 1936 and 1937, respectively. Surrealist artist and patron Edward James commissioned both of these pieces from Dali. James inherited a large English estate in West Dean, West Sussex when he was five and was one of the foremost supporters of the Surrealists in the 1930s. Lobsters and telephones had strong sexual connotations for Dali according to the display caption for the lobster telephone at the Tate Gallery, and he drew a close analogy between food and sex. The telephone was functional, and James purchased four of them from Dolly to replace the phones in his retreat home. One now appears at the Tate Gallery, the second can be found at the German Telephone Museum in Frankfurt, the third belongs to the Edward James Foundation, and the fourth is at the National Gallery of Australia. The wooden satin Mae West lip sofa was shaped after the lips of actress Mae West whom Dolly apparently found fascinating. West was previously the subject of Dolly's 1935 painting The Face of Mae West. The Mae West Lip Sofa currently resides at the Brighton and Hove Museum in England. Between 1941 and 1970, Dolly created an ensemble of 39 pieces of jewelry. Many pieces are intricate, and some contain moving parts. The most famous assemblage, the Royal Heart, is made of gold and is encrusted with 46 rubies, 42 diamonds and four emeralds, created in such a way that center beats much like a real heart. Dali himself commented that without an audience, without the presence of spectators, these jewels would not fulfill the function for which they came into being. The viewer, then, is the ultimate artist. The Dali, Joa collection is in the Dali Theatre Museum in Figueres, Catalonia, Spain. Dali took a stab at industrial design in the 1970s with a 500-piece run of the upscale Swami tableware by Timo Sarpaneva that Dali decorated for the German Rosenthal porcelain maker's studio Lini. In theater, Dali constructed the scenery for Federico Garcia Lorca's 1927 romantic play Mariana Pineda. For Bacchanal, a ballet based on and set of the music of Richard Wagner's 1845 opera Tannhäuser, Dali provided both the set design and the libretto. Bacchanal was followed by set designs for Labyrinth in 1941 and the Three-Cornered Hat in 1949. Dolly became intensely interested in film when he was young, going to the theater most Sundays. He was part of the era where silent films were being viewed and drawing on the medium of film became popular. He believed there were two dimensions to the theories of film and cinema, things themselves, the facts that are presented in the world of the camera, and photographic imagination the way the camera shows the picture and how creative or imaginative it looks. Dali was active in front of and behind the scenes in the film world. He is credited as co-creator of Luis Buñuel's surrealist film Unchen Analu, a 17-minute French art film co-written with Luis Buñuel that is widely remembered for its graphic opening scene simulating the slashing of a human eyeball with a razor. In Unchen Analu, surreal imagery and irrational discontinuities in time and space produce a dreamlike quality. The second film he produced with Buñuel was entitled Lage d'Or, and it was performed at Studio 28 in Paris in 1930. Lage d'Or was banned for years after fascist and anti-Semitic groups staged a stink bomb and ink-throwing riot in the Paris theater where it was hound. Both of these films, Unchen Andalou and Lage d'Or, have had a tremendous impact on the independent surrealist film movement. If Unchen Andalou stands as the supreme record of surrealism's adventures into the realm of the unconscious, then Lodge Door is perhaps the most trenchant and implacable expression of its revolutionary intent. Dali worked with other famous filmmakers, such as Alfred Hitchcock. The most well-known of his film projects is probably the dream sequence in Hitchcock's Spellbound, which delves into themes of psychoanalysis. Hitchcock needed a dreamlike quality to his film, which dealt with the idea that a repressed experience can directly trigger a neurosis, and he knew that Dali's work would help create the atmosphere he wanted in his film. Dali also worked with Walt Disney on the short film production Destino. Completed in 2003 by Baker Bloodworth and Walt's nephew Roy E. Disney, it contains dreamlike images of strange figures flying and walking about. It is based on Mexican songwriter Armando Dominguez's song Destino.
When Disney hired Dahl to help produce the film in 1946, they were not prepared for the quantity of work that lay ahead. For eight months, they worked on it continuously, until their efforts had to stop when they realized they were in financial trouble. However, it was eventually finished 48 years later, and shown in various film festivals. The film consists of Dali's artwork interacting with Disney's character animation. In 1960 Dali and the photographer Philippe Halsman made a documentary video called Chaos and Creation, that showed him creating a painting. Dali completed only one other film in his lifetime, Impressions of Upper Mongolia, in which he narrated a story about an expedition in search of giant hallucinogenic mushrooms. The imagery was based on microscopic uric acid stains on the brass band of a ballpoint pen on which Dali had been urinating for several weeks. In the mid-1970s, film director Alejandro Hodorowsky cast Dali in the role of the Padisha Emperor in a production of Dune, based on the novel by Frank Herbert. According to the 2013 documentary on the film, Yodorowsky's Dune, Hodorowsky met Dali in the King Cold Bar in the St. Regis Hotel in Manhattan to discuss the role. Dali expressed interest in the film but required as a condition of appearing that he be made the highest paid actor in Hollywood. Hodorowsky accordingly cast Dali as the emperor, but he planned to cut Dali's screen time to mere minutes, promising he be the highest paid actor on a per minute basis. The film was ultimately never made. In the year 1927, Dali began to write the libretto for an opera, which he called Etredu. He wrote this together with Federico Garcia Lerque one afternoon in the Café Regina Victoria in Madrid. In 1974, for a recording in Paris, the opera was adapted by the Spanish writer Manuel Vázquez Montalban, who wrote the libretto, while the music was created by Igor Wakevich. During the recording, however, Dali refused to follow the text written by Montalban, and instead, began to improvise in the belief that Salvador Dali never repeats himself. Dali built the repertoire in the fashion and photography businesses as well. His cooperation with Italian fashion designer Elsa Schiaparelli was well known, when Dali was commissioned to produce a white dress with a lobster print. Other designs Dali made for her include a shoe-shaped hat, and a pink belt with lips for a buckle. He was also involved in creating textile designs and perfume bottles. In 1950, Dali created a special costume for the year 2045 with Christian Dior. Photographers with whom he collaborated include Man Ray, Brissai, Cecil Beaton, and Philippe Halsman. With Man Ray and Brissai, Dali photographed nature, with the others, he explored a range of obscure topics, including the Dali Atomica series, inspired by his painting Lead Atomica which in one photograph depicts a painter's easel, three cats, a bucket of water, and Dali himself floating in the air. One of Dali's most unorthodox artistic creations may have been an entire persona, in addition to his own. At a French nightclub in 1965, Dali met a mandolier, a fashion model then known as Piki Doslo. Lear became his protege and muse, later writing about their affair in her authorized biography My Life with Dali. Transfixed by the mannish, larger-than-life Lear, Dali masterminded her successful transition from modeling to the music world advising her on self-presentation and helping spin mysterious stories about her origin as she took the disco art scene by storm. According to Lear, she and Dolly were united in a spiritual marriage on a deserted mountaintop. She was referred to as Dolly's Frankenstein, and some observers believed Lear's assumed name was a pun on the French phrase La Mondale, or Lover of Dolly. Lear took the place of an earlier muse, Ultraviolet, who had left Dolly's side to join the factory of Andy Warhol. Both former apprentices would go on to successfully promote their own careers in the arts. On April 10, 2005, they joined a panel discussion reminiscent Soft Dolly, a conversation with friends of the artist as part of a symposium The Dolly Renaissance for a major retrospective Dolly show at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Their conversation is recorded in the 236-page exhibition catalog The Dolly Renaissance, New Perspectives on His Life and Art After 1940. Architectural achievements include his Port Ligat House near Cadaqués, as well as his theater and museum in Figueres. A major work outside of Spain was the temporary dream of Venus Surrealist Pavilion at the 1939 New York World's Fair, which contained within it a number of unusual sculptures and statues, including live performers posing as statues. Under the encouragement of poet Federico Garcia Lorca, Dali attempted an approach to a literary career through the means of a pure novel. In his only novel Hidden Faces, Dali describes, in vividly visual terms, the intrigues and love affairs of a group of dazzling, eccentric aristocrats who, 
with their luxurious and extravagant lifestyle, symbolized the decadence of the 1930s. The Comte de Grand Science so launched a clay to pursue an awkward love affair, but property transactions, interwar political turmoil, the French resistance, his marriage to another woman and her responsibilities as a landowner on businesswoman drive them apart. It is variously set in Paris, rural France, Casablanca in North Africa and Palm Springs in the United States. Secondary characters include aging widow Barbara Rogers, her bisexual daughter Veronica, Veronica's sometime female lover Betka, and Baba, a disfigured U.S. fighter pilot. The novel concludes at the end of the Second World War, with Solange dying before Grand Sai can return to his former property and reunite with her. The novel was written in New York, and translated by Hack and Chevalier. His other, non-fictional literary works include The Secret Life of Salvador Dali, Diary of a Genius, and We, The Paranoid Critical Revolution. The artist worked extensively in the graphic arts, producing many etchings and lithographs. While his early work in printmaking is equal in quality to his important paintings, as he grew older he would sell the rights to images but not be involved in the print production itself. In addition, a large number of fakes were produced in the 1980s and 1990s, thus further confusing the Dali print market. Dali's politics played a significant role in his emergence as an artist. In his youth, he embraced both anarchism and communism, though his writings tell anecdotes off making radical political statements more to shock listeners than from any deep conviction. This was in keeping with Dali's allegiance to the Dada movement. As he grew older his political allegiances changed, especially as the Surrealist movement went through transformations under the leadership of the Trotskyist writer André Breton, who is said to have called Dali in for questioning on his politics. In his 1970 book Dali by Dali, Dali declared himself to be both an anarchist and monarchist. With the outbreak of the Spanish Civil War, Dali fled from the fighting and refused to align himself with any group. He did the same during World War II for which he was heavily criticized, George Orwell accused him of scuttling off like a rat as soon as France is in danger after Dali had prospered in France during the pre-war years. When the European war approaches he has one preoccupation only, how to find a place which has good cookery and from which he can make a quick bolt if danger comes too near, Orwell observed. In a notable 1944 review of Dali's autobiography, Orwell wrote, one ought to be able to hold in one's head simultaneously the two facts that Dali is a good draftsman and a disgusting human being. After his return to Catalonia post-World War II, Dali moved closer to the authoritarian regime of Francisco Franco. Some of Dali's statements were supportive, congratulating Franco for his actions aimed at clearing Spain of destructive forces. Dali, having returned to the Catholic faith and becoming increasingly religious as time went on, may have been referring to the Republican atrocities during the Spanish Civil War. Dali sent telegrams to Franco, praising him for signing death warrants for prisoners. He even met Franco personally, and painted a portrait of Franco's granddaughter. He also once sent a telegram praising the conductor, Romanian communist leader Nicolae Ceausescu, for his adoption of a scepter as part of his regalia. The Romanian daily newspaper Cintia published it, without suspecting its mocking aspect. One of Dali's few possible bits of open disobedience was his continued praise of Federico Garcia Lorca even in the years when Lorca's works were banned. Dali, a colorful and imposing presence with his ever-present long gape, walking stick, haughty expression, and upturned waxed mustache, was famous for having said that every morning upon awakening, I experience a supreme pleasure, that of being Salvador Dali. In the 1960s, he gave the actress Mia Farrow a dead mouse in a bottle hand-painted, which her mother, actress Maureen O'Sullivan, demanded be removed from her house. Dolly's religious views were a matter of interest. In interviews Dolly revealed his mysticism. In his later years, while still remaining a Roman Catholic, Dolly also claimed to be an agnostic. In his 1942 autobiography The Secret Life of Salvador Dolly, he sums up his life story with an impassioned defense of the Catholic Church and religion in general. In one passage he states I believe, above all, in the real and unfathomable force of the philosophic Catholicism of France and in that of the militant Catholicism of Spain. Dali also had great respect for the Jesuit priest and philosopher Teilhard de Chardin and was fascinated by his Omega Point theory. Dali's 1959 painting The Ecumenical Council is said to represent the interconnectedness of the Omega Point. Dali frequently traveled with his pet ocelot Babu even bringing it aboard the luxury ocean liner SS France. 
He was also known to avoid paying tabs at restaurants be drawing on the checks he wrote. His theory was the restaurant would never want to cash such a valuable piece of art, and he was usually correct. Besides visual puns, Dolly shared in the surrealist delight in verbal puns, obscure allusions, and word games. He often spoke in a bizarre combination of French, Spanish, Catalan, and English which was sometimes amusing as well as arcane. When interviewed by Mike Wallace on his 60 Minutes television show, Dolly kept referring to himself in the third person, as the Divino Dolly, and told the startled Wallace matter-of-factly that he did not believe in his death. On January 27, 1957, he was the mystery guest on the U.S. panel show What's My Line? and signed the chalkboard with thick white paint. His answers were misleading and prompted guidance from host John Daly. Dolly appeared in public on a number of occasions with an anteater, notably on a lead in Paris in 1969 and on the Dick Cavett show on March 6, 1970 when he carried a small anteater on stage. On the show, he surprised fellow guest Lillian Gish by flinging the anteater onto her lap. In Carlos Lozano's biography, Sex, Surrealism, Dolly, and Me, produced with the collaboration of Clifford Thurlow, Lozano makes it clear that Dolly never stopped being a surrealist. As Dolly said of himself, the only difference between me and the surrealists is that I am a surrealist. Salvador Dolly has been cited as a major inspiration by many modern artists, such as Damien Hirst, Jeff Koons, and most other modern surrealists. Salvador Dali's manic expression and famous mustache have made him something of a cultural icon for the bizarre and surreal. He has been portrayed on film by Robert Pattinson in Little Ashes, and by Adrian Brody in Midnight in Paris. He was also parodied in a series of painting skits on Captain Kangaroo as Salvador Silly and in a Sesame Street Muppet skit as Salvador Dada. The Salvador Dali Desert in Bolivia and the Dali Crater on the planet Mercury are named for him. Dali produced over 1,500 paintings in his career in addition to producing illustrations for books, lithographs, designs for theater sets and costumes, a great number of drawings, dozens of sculptures, and various other projects, including an animated short film for Disney. He also collaborated with director Jack Bond in 1965, creating a movie titled Dali in New York. Below is a chronological sample of important and representative work, as well as some notes on what Dali did in particular years. Thanks for watching. Don't forget like the video and don't forget to subscribe.